Hello and welcome to the recap of today's CodeBuddies.org live code session. Today we continued working on our sustainable urban design app. We've got a notebook with a standalone urban analysis that can be applied to different cities. I've, I started off by hard coding the analysis to one city and downloading data locally and working with that, but today we were able to change the code in a way that lets um, the end user specify a city and run the same analysis. Uh, there were some caveats and uh, some, some lessons learned in that process, but let's take a look. Um, essentially what we did is add a new dependency to our pro project called OSMNX. It's like an open stream map network uh, extractor or uh, analysis plugin. It's got quite a lot of features. We've only scratched the surface. Everything else is pretty much the same as last uh, time we left off. We've got GeoPandas is doing the heavy lifting, working with the data frames, helping us filter them, doing searches within the data frames. Uh, we got matplotlib plotting stuff and a few operations geometric from the Shapely library. Actually, this might not even be used anymore. I can probably clean it up. So let's take a look. Uh, we're just checking out. Op uh, so this OSMNX, OX is called for short here, 0.15.1. And what we can do is right at the top, you can specify the location of your analysis. So if you're not interested in Tampere, Finland, uh, you can change the city, state, and country. Uh, you can do an, this analysis on an entire country or even smaller regions. What we did realize is that depending on the size of your city, the processing and querying uh, can be take a many minutes, uh, five or ten minutes in some cases, which is not unreasonable, but just be prepared for that. So essentially what we've done is just geocoded a location dictionary. The dictionary makes it explicit what each of the components are. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of ambiguity where a city might have the same name as another city or a, a, a county or some other um, you know, geographic unit. So by splitting our location query out in this way, uh, it makes it simple for this geocoding function to look up that location and returns it as a geo data frame. Everything here is pretty much using this geo pandas data frame. So this is essentially the geometry that was returned for the city of Tampere, Finland, which is true to form. Uh, the main city is down here and there's a large uh, rural area uh, spanning up into here. So what we want to do is for any given location, we want to be able to find food sources, bus stops, and then do a composite analysis, and buildings, sorry, building footprints, and do a composite analysis to find the overlap. Let's go ahead and just hop back up here, though. And this is going to be repeating, but essentially, we have to figure out how OpenStreetMap identifies each of these amenities. And um, what we're after, our kind of definition of food sources are more or less places you could get um, you know, a quality food, healthy food uh, at a reasonable price. So not necessarily fast food places and convenience stores are kind of on the fringe of that. And, you know, we can't really split out the subclasses of convenience stores, but I wouldn't consider a, some convenience stores as a, a source of food when they only have maybe um, chips and cookies and, and sodas and things like that. In any case, um, these are the terms that OpenStreetMap data contain. And we so are looking for shops of subtype supermarket convenience or bakery. And we take that place we defined earlier and get points of interest. And this can take, um, depending on what the query is, it can take a few minutes. With these points of interest, there's only 140 or so. It came back pretty quick, 400 milliseconds. Uh, and the structure of the data, it's quite a sparse table. There's many columns that are only, I think, used on a selective subset of the data. That's one of the sort of uh, downfalls of kind of binning everything into the same data type. Uh, OpenStreetMap is sort of an organically evolving data model. So in any case, that's how it's structured. Not everything uh, has an amenity column, for example. There's a lot of NANs through there. so. Maybe there's even shops that we're omitting that um, just aren't classified in a way we're expecting. In any case, we have 100, about 140 food sources in Tampra, and they're dispersed like this. This rural area, I suspect, has more food sources, but 
for whatever reason they aren't in the data source or they're classified differently than we were searching for. Uh, bus stops took a little bit longer. In our case, there's um, 5,000 bus stops in the whole city of Tampere, but it only took around 10 seconds to run this query. Um, we tried this on Berlin, the city of Berlin, and it was much, much slower. We're, I'm not exactly sure why. And so it's just l be prepared on some of these queries, uh, grab a cup of tea, or actually I think it was the buildings. So this one only took 31 seconds, but returned 40,000 building footprints in Tampere. Um, and we also use a different method to than points of interest. There's a footprints module with a footprints from place. So in all of the cases, we're able to use the same location. Yeah, so it means that it's going to kind of use that shape uh, to, identif to identify the boundaries. And you can see the rural area is pretty sparse. Most of the urban development is down here in the southern part of Tampere. Tom, uh, sorry, the OpenStreetMap data are in latitude, longitude format. In order to do certain geographic um, processes, uh, such as creating buffers, uh, or even doing geo within queries, it needs a uh, projected data, uh, projected uh, coordinate reference system. So we use this pseudo mercator. Uh, fortunately, the geodata frame has a helper function that just does that. And we override the each of the data frames in place rather than creating a new result. This, uh, by default, geodata data frames are immutable so that you don't accidentally change the data under your feet and maybe break something or lose some columns. So you have to be explicit if you want to do it in place. I think that's a good design pattern. It's just something to keep in mind. Then each geodata frame has a geometry column. It's literally named geometry and it's also significant that it, the data type are geometries. If you change the name or the data type you'll get unexpected behaviors or your analysis won't work. Um, the, the by default geometry column, well for building footprints, I don't have it uh, printed out here, but there it's a multi-polygon because building footprints can be any arbitrary shape and sometimes multiple um, polygons if you've got, uh, I'm not sure, just in some cases that's the way they are. And what we were after is to get, to simplify things, we would just want to get a, a rough approximation of the center of that building so we can do a uh, containment query. So we did a little bit of um, shuffling here and actually Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, so this is a, an example, it's just not called multi-polygon. So it's a polygon, it's got a lot of points and lines connecting them. Um, the geometry column is so it's com relatively complex. We create a new column called centroid and just get the centroid property for each of those geometries. And this is going to make it much faster for us to do these, these computations, uh, the, for example, geo within, and we just rename those columns. So we renamed the geometry column footprint because that's kind of what it is, the building footprint. And then we renamed the centroid column geometry because you you have to have a column named geometry. And we did that in place. Uh, we can check the data types here. So we've got a footprint column and a geometry column. And both of those data types are geometry. Essentially what we want to do is then find buildings that are within a reasonable distance of these. We've gone through this analysis before, but let's just take one more look at it. Uh, for completeness. We're kind of defining a convenience factor here. Uh, food being in convenient distance um, would be under a kilometer where you could walk to it maybe. It's arbitrary, but we need to just specify something to move forward. So we just look for each of those food sources. We create a one kilometer buffer around them. They're, all of them are points, so it's a circle and it looks like this. And we did that same thing with the bus stops. You can see the bus network is much more complicated, but these buffering operations are pretty quick. And as an aside, I'm believing we're going to be able to do the buffering, at least the selection of the buffer radius in the client using TurfJS, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. We're still working in IPython to develop the server code. Now the buffers, buffer geometry, each of the items returns its own circle. They have some overlap in there. 
Uh, so what we do is just basically join them together so that when there is overlap, it just creates one larger feature. And we call it a catchment, even though catchment maybe not that much more intuitive to people than a unitary, uh, sorry, a unary union. Um, but trying to get more into natural language territory than set theoretical or kind of ecological. Now the slower part of the analysis is when we want to do these queries, we want to find buildings within those catchments and essentially um, assign that to a new column in the data frame that allows us to get the ratio or the counts of those um, buildings that are within the catchment. So we can see in, in Tompro there's about 40% uh, of the buildings are within uh, a kilometer of a food source, convenience store, supermarket, or bakery. But there's a lot of them, particularly in the rural areas, that don't have that convenience. So people would be more inclined to drive in those cases. Similarly, uh, we wanted to combine the, uh, houses that are within a food catchment and the bus catchment. Now this bus geometry is so much more complicated that uh, we're just trying to warn people it's going to take a while to run this. These are jobs that would likely be scheduled uh, to run once a week or once a month on a server, something along those lines when the, the data are updated. Um, but we'll need to be able to run them when the parameters are tuned on a per uh, user basis. Potentially each user could be defining their own analysis. So we have to figure out what the use case is here. But in any case, we have the moving parts and we have a basic recipe to follow. Access to amenities here just means, I think I mentioned this, but uh, in case I'm repeating myself, but uh, it's just buildings that both have convenient access to food and bus uh, um, or transport network. And the transport network buffer, by the way, is 250 meters, so pretty close, not very far. Walk, well, we did that just so we would have um, something meaningful. Otherwise, there was almost no difference between, with a larger catchment for the bus areas, there was almost no difference between the um, the access to amenities maps that we see here. So here's the output of it. And basically we see that uh, only 30% meet both criteria. So we, we lose about 10% of the buildings. And these are could be any type of building. We don't know that these are residences or not. Um, there's a lot of caveats here. Nothing's perfect. Is a, this is a prototype. And we're just working to improve things. And in different cities, the data quality are drastically different. We looked in North Korea and Germany and Texas for just different examples of the uh, urban environments and the data availability. So one of the kind of hopeful side effects of this project will be to encourage um, municipalities to improve and urban planners to improve the quality of open street map data. So these types of analysis will be more accurate and useful. So the final thing more or less we do in this notebook is just, I, I define just an arbitrary um, color map just so that we could see, uh, hopefully this is a accessible one. I'm not an expert in color maps and honestly I think it's nice when the plotting library handles that choice of color map for you based on the fact that the data are categorical and takes into account other things like accessibility. Um, but if I recall, for whatever reason, the um, classes of data weren't readily discernible, so I just created one uh, that wasn't hopefully too obtrusive and makes it easy to distinguish even for visually impaired people. But again, this is just a prototype. Um, things like this we can improve on later. And essentially, we're going to plot here the buildings based on whether or not they're in the food catchment. So the places in green have pretty good access to food. I believe there's just a lack of data here, because um, I'm almost positive there should be a convenience store or some other um, food source in, in some of these locations. And then again, we when we combine them to access to amenities, uh, I'll have to scroll up and down, but you can kind of see it gets more patchy. Like down here, it's kind of continuous, but there's some splotches here. Uh, and you can use probably a visual diffing algorithm or something like that to make it more apparent, um, the differences in these results, as well as allow people um, to tweak the parameters and add other types of amenities, such as schools, playgrounds, open spaces, you know, maybe having good fire coverage. There's a lot of different aspects here. The main moving parts that were changed today is to 
make it so this notebook is self-contained. You don't have to rely on any other um, pre-prepared data. You can just run the notebook, change the parameters, get the data from the latest data from OpenStreetMap, and run it in your own uh, area of interest. And uh, this is a little bit um, redundant. I already had checked the proportional representation. But the reason this is important is not only can you show visually the situation, but you can quantify it in a way that you can take to uh, a meeting and say, here's where we are now. And maybe here's where we've been. You can track this over time as the data uh, are evolved. And as the urban environment changes, you might be able to track um, progress towards a, a goal, for example, working towards one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, yes, so that's about it. We've, m we've finally merged this pull request. It's a, just a, a prototypal notebook. It's under the experiment, uh, experiments section of our, our repository. We have got an updated instructions on how to run it with a note about a potential uh, missing, potentially missing dependency that I found on Ubuntu Linux. Our next steps will be to sort of figure out where to delineate this code, how to integrate it into our JavaScript client and Django backend, where to divide it up, and what the user experience will be like when they, when people define their own analysis, they pick their own location, maybe select some amenities and buffer uh, parameters. Uh, maybe all of that can be done more or less through the client, and this, these buffers could be serialized and sent to the server uh, where it would queue a job, and when the result of that job is returned, the user could be notified in some way, perhaps through a push notification or something like that, that their analysis was done. This is all speculative right now. Uh, haven't really worked with the Turf JS library. It looks pretty capable, though. And uh, we'll just have to strike the right balance of, um, you know, client uh, computers. The power can vary greatly, and we'd like this to run on a tablet computer and be, you know, usable via a touch screen, for example. So uh, I did uh, some quick experiments with um, open layers. It's got a really nice interface for uh, manipulating the geometries by touch, uh, at least by click, and in conjunction with TurfJS. Uh, might be a really good recipe to take the project forward. But all right, that's been a recap of today's CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. If you'd like to get involved with this project or other projects, stop on by CodeBuddies.org. CodeBuddies platform is also open source on GitHub. You can find the link on the CodeBuddies.org front page or visit uh, github.com slash CodeBuddies. This sustainable urban design project is also uh, welcoming and open to new contributors of any skill type. If you're a designer, a coder, a, you're interested in sustainability in general, you'd like to help with the documentation, there's a lot of ways to, uh, we would appreciate help. So thank you all for your time. Have a good day, and I hope you're doing well out there.